Uh, the next speaker of tonight's laser is David Stork, <clears throat> who has held uh, faculty positions at several universities um, in the United States and Europe on um, um, physics, uh, uh, mathematics, uh, computer science, um, art, art, history, psychology, and others. He is um, a fellow of seven international technical universities and uh, is going to talk about um, computer analysis of Vermeer paintings uh, following a, a major symposium held uh, in um, Amsterdam in March uh, 2023. Uh, all yours. Learning and, and uh, for the past quarter century, I've been applying computation problems in the history and interpretation of fine art paintings and drawings. I'll have time today to show just some of my analysis of lighting in Vermeer, but I've addressed problems involving perspective, color, marks, brush strokes, iconography, and more in the works of many artists. If we ask the simplest technical question about the illumination in this painting, it would be, what's the direction of illumination? And if two art scholars disagreed, how would we adjudicate? How would we tell who is right? It's equally valid interpretations. Let me show you six techniques from computer vision that answer this question absolutely clearly, and then explain how these results enrich our understanding of this painting and can be used elsewhere in the study of art. The methods fall into two general categories. In model independent methods, we don't need to know or make any assumptions about the three-dimensional form in the tableau. I'll perform a very simple cast shadow analysis and then apply a occluding contour algorithm. Then I'll turn to model dependent methods uh, where we do need to know or make assumptions about the three-dimensional forms in the tableau. I'll make a computer graphics model of the pearl, of her eye, of her face, and then the entire uh, tableau. The simplest method is cast shadow analysis. We take a point on the occluder, such as the uh, tip of her nose, and its corresponding uh, cast shadow point, draw a straight line between them, and uh, that goes to the direction uh, of illumination uh, with air bars here. And we find the direction is 150 plus or minus two degrees, where throughout I'm going to measure angles with respect to the horizontal. The next method is based on a technique called shape from shading. If we had a three-dimensional model of the girl's face, a set of equations would allow us to infer the direction of illumination based on what we see in the painting. We could describe such a three-dimensional model by so-called normal vectors, the arrows perpendicular to the surface of her face. But here we don't know the uh, directions of the normal uh, vectors throughout her face. Well, uh, the clever insight is to restrict our attention to the outer boundary or occluding contour um, where we do know the normals. The any normal there must be perpendicular to the contour itself and in the plane of the painting, pointing neither towards us nor away. It's sort of like a um, flagpole on the horizon. This makes the mathematics much simpler and allows us to estimate the direction to the illumination. Incidentally, as far as I can tell, the first person to understand this principle was Leonardo, who in his Codex Urbinus illustrated the principle. He, of course, more accurately, we use it to analyze a painting, uh, the lighting in a portrait. The result of the direction um, is that it's uh, 140 plus or minus um, four degrees. Now for the model dependent methods. I took a high resolution photograph of the pearl in the painting and could thus describe mathematically its occluding contour. We can then confidently assume the pearl is cylindrically symmetric, the full 3D computer graphics model of the pearl. Then you must texture map it, put the white on it, um, uh, and adjust the relative intensities of the diffuse and matte reflections and, uh, and the highlight reflections. And then we can adjust the position of the virtual illumination anywhere we want until the rendered pearl matches that in the painting as closely as possible. Then we have an estimate to the direction to the illumination, which turns out to be 150 
plus minus four degrees. What about the highlights on her eyes? It is basic optics, but the source of light, her eyeball and the eye of Vermeer must lie in a plane. And the tip angle of that plane tells us the direction to the illumination. We um, mark a point on the center of her eye, draw a straight line through the highlight, and the resulting tip angle tells us the direction to the illumination, which in this case is about 150 plus or minus two degrees. The most sophisticated technique we use uh, is based again on this principle of shape from shading. If we had a three-dimensional model of her face, a shape from shading algorithm would infer the direction to the illumination that um, for this, but uh, that is if we had a model of her face um, that for this model would lead to the direction uh, we find in the painting, but we don't have a 3D, 3D model of her so we did the next best thing. We used a generic face model. Um, it's actually a, a, of a man's face. And we adjusted its pose to match that in the painting uh, as closely as possible. Then we temporarily assumed that was her, uh, the model of her face and inferred the best direction to the illumination. But of course, that won't be accurate because this is not a correct model. So we then assume the direction, the estimated direction to the illuminate, and we the shape from shading algorithm fixes her face, adjusts the length of the nose and so forth. And now we have a better model of her face. And then we can work again and take that better model and then infer the direction of the illumination, go back and forth until it settles down. Uh, those of you in computer science will recognize this as the EM or expectation maximization algorithm. And the direction turned out to be 160 plus or minus five degrees. Our last method was to build a full 3D computer graphics model. There are assumptions and uncertainties in this method, but no bias, statistical bias. That is to say, the method does not mean the average of the light will be too high or too low. I, I know it looks a bit weird. Uh, and when I showed this at the Maritz house, the home of the, the painting, the uh, Friends of the Maritz house uh, went crazy because they, they'd never seen the back of their. Um, so then we're going to stop it in the configuration that matches the actual painting, and we're going to move the uh, light source around. And I'm going to stop it in the configuration that matches the actual painting, and then we're going to fly around Vermeer Studio to look at it from uh, lots of different directions. So here we go and moves. Uh, to the configuration that matches the, the painting, as I'll show you in a moment. And now I around Vermeer's studio to look at it from lots of different directions. Um, and then we're going to stop it and do what's called an alpha blend, basically a blurring from the computer graphics model to the painting to show that it matches um, uh, extremely well. So look carefully at the location of the shadows and, the, and so forth all the way down. So here's the alpha blend and it matches extremely well. Um, so here are three, a little bit too hot, a little bit too low and just right. Uh, in this way, we find the direction to the illumination is about 160 plus or minus five de uh, degrees. So here are our results. The best estimate to the direction of the illumination is 150 degrees. And that's not very important. What is important is the very small uncertainty or standard deviation of these estimates. They all agree incredibly well. This shows the astounding agreement uh, between the various estimates. Here's one way to visualize the results. The red line points in that 155 degrees and the yellow curve called the cardioid tells us the relative probability of finding the light in a given direction. So it's most likely in that direction and, oh, I don't know, 50% if you go off in this direction and so forth. And the fact that the yellow cardioid is so and, uh, stretched out uh, shows the remarkable agreement among the estimates. Um, so what? Why would an art scholar, oh, why would an art scholar care about these results? As this audience in uh, Amsterdam certainly knows this is not a portrait. We don't know who this girl is. Instead, it's a so-called trony or character study um, head here to celebrate youth and beauty 
uh, primarily for the delectation of a male patron. There have been weak suggestions that Vermeer painted the girl from his imagination, but the incredible agreement among the lighting estimates make this extraordinarily unlikely. Imagine five of the methods agreed closely, but that the estimate from the pearl differed significantly. That would suggest the pearl was added later, possibly by another artist. This happens occasionally in art. For instance, a hat added later. To Such lighting analysis can help us identify the number of so-called hands in a painting. For instance, in a Renaissance portrait of multiple figures, if the lighting is different among different um, subjects, it strongly suggests they, they were executed under different studio conditions, possibly different times of year, possibly different artists, a master, say, and his students. I don't have time to discuss it uh, this evening, but such lighting analysis was important in refuting David Hockney's claim that some artists of the early Renaissance secretly used optical projections during the execution of their work. They did not. Lighting uh, can also be used to help date a painting, or at least the date of the scene dis, um, depicted. This is, um, there is some timing information evident in uh, Vermeer's view of Delft, such as the clock on the wall, or on the building, Shidam gate, the costumes of the figures, and of course, provenance and stylistic information. But how can lighting analysis help? Perspective analysis of the painting and contemporaneous maps and architectural records show us, uh, allow us to pinpoint uh, Vermeer's viewpoint. Don Olson has pointed out that the lighting on the tower, the Neue Kirk, the new um, flechettes and elsewhere, give rather precise estimates to the direction to the sun. The church still stands, and this helps refine uh, lighting es estimates. Incidentally, we know when the clock was added to the tower, so the painting was surely executed after that. Uh, after that time, here's a um, remark. Here's a remark. Of, so here are the flechettes. Um, so here's this photograph: a one-year exposure consisting of 365 traces of the sun's diurnal motion across the sky because uh, uh, the breaks in the lines are due to cloudy days. Of course, the uh, precise visual position, position of the sun on any day depends upon the hour as well as the latitude and longitude of the uh, locations. So I calculated the position of the sun throughout 1659 Delft, careful to account for changes in calendars, time zones and such. Then the estimate of the illumination direction from the Neue Kerk and elsewhere, and the local time given by the clock on the Schiedam Gate places the sun here in the sky, which corresponds to um, 8 a.m. local time, September 3rd or 4th, 1659, which is a refinement on the estimates used uh, by more traditional art historical methods. My last topic concerns claims Vermeer used optical devices directly during the execution of some of his works. There have been talks uh, refuting claims that Vermeer traced an image in a camera obscura. My own technical analyses uh, involving lighting, perspective, interreflections, putative optical phenomena such as blur spots, and much more corroborate the rejections that were uh, presented at the um, uh, symposium. But I'd like to address a different claim that Vermeer secretly built a catadioptric telescope. That is one consisting of a lens and a concave mirror, along with a special mirror comparator to execute the music lesson. Here's the theory's proponent, Tim Jennison, the film Tim's Vermeer documenting his years long effort um, and the American magicians Penn and Teller who produced and narrated in the upper left. Here is the meter long uh, telescope Jennison promotes and my computer ray tracing uh, diagram for analysis of its operation. And here is Tim, Dem oh, uh, and here's Tim's demonstration painting on the left and along with Vermeer's original. It's pretty impressive. 
Nevertheless, there are so many reasons to reject Jenison's claim that Vermeer used such a telescope. For instance, this would have been the world's most complicated system on the planet, more complicated than the Newtonian telescope invented a decade later by the towering genius Isaac Newton. There were no optics found in Vermeer's estate shortly after his death, for instance. The proposed painting method is astoundingly difficult. Jonathan Jansen, not Jensen, but an artist, Jansen, um, who also spoke at the uh, symposium, is an accomplished artist and hosts the world's best Vermeer website. He tried twice, but could never get the telescope system to work, always um, requiring Tim's intervention, and yet other reasons. But I'm going to address the claims the, propo the proponents find most impressive or most persuasive, those based on lighting. First, geometric and perspective considerations allow us to um, infer where the putative telescope would have been. Uh, so here, uh, computer graphics recon where the telescope is or the so-called center of projection, you get different um, they're all in proper perspective, but they, they differ by um, being orthographic and so forth. So if you have the painting, you can go back and infer where the um, uh, uh, projector would have been. Um, here are some of the quotes by the promoters. Philip Stedman, uh, who wrote uh, uh, Vermeer's camera, wrote the most powerful evidence in favor of this uh, idea has to do with tonality. The fall off in lightness across the back wall cannot be seen. Not even Vermeer could have seen the difference between the luminance at the right and the left. You just cannot see a shadow gradient in tone like that. And Jenison says such a gradient is something that an artist really cannot see. It would have been invisible, possible to see it. Well, but is a lighting gradient across the rear wall really invisible? Here are photographs of a full-scale set for Lady at the Virginals and the music lesson. And here is a very carefully um, constructed computer graphics model obeying strict, we call it radiosity. Basically, uh, the computer has light strike here and bounce and bounce and bounce and so forth, um, just as it would happen in physics. Computer simulates the light bouncing all the way through. Uh, in all cases, the luminance gradient along the back wall is clearly visible. Such gradients appear in art from many artists, none of whom used optical uh, elements, including uh, Edward Hopper along here. And here are those gradients just from those paintings. Uh, the original grading and then one left, right, reverse to show just how much the gradient occurs. Uh, the computer graphics model Tim Jennison's version, Vermeer's version, Peter de Hoek's, uh, and others, and even um, Hopper's um, uh, girl at a sewing machine. This refutes the proponent's central evidence, and we must reject the telescope um, claim. Let me conclude with a broader point. We have seen uh, how imaging has... Uh, here and his and his works. Perhaps over a hundred billion dollars has been spent by very smart people developing computer image analysis, thereby re revolutionizing every discipline that deals with images, physics, biology, medicine, ocean science, psychology, self-driving cars, and so on and so on and so on. All except one, art. Particularly uh, ironic because art provides the most sophisticated, interesting, varied, subtle, and valuable images ever made, posing numerous questions that have been captivating scholars and the public alike, questions for which computer methods can help, in some cases help profoundly. Anyway, that's the premise behind my forthcoming book, Pixels and Paintings, Foundations of Computer-Assisted Connoisseurship, that will come out in September. Thank you very much. Questions in the audience here? Yeah. So since the assumption is that um, the paint is exactly 
following direction of the government. What if he took a liberty to put a shade just for the this is I get oh, every time. Thank you. It's a it's an excellent question. We don't assume that Vermeer is accurately painting. We test it. It is possible that all of these would be very different, and that would be the artwork, and it would tell us more about it. It's only after the fact that they all agreed that we can say this wouldn't have happened by uh, by chance. By analogy, art scholars say, yeah, you're assuming it's called the naive fallacy that artists are trying to be like bad photo or like photographs. Not so, not so at all. So for instance, if you take medieval art, we can do a perspective analysis of it and look for where there's a central vanishing point and, and they, it, won't, it won't line up very much at all because they weren't. We don't need to assume that they were obeying the laws of geometrical perspective to use the tools to expose that. So for instance, I've used these techniques in Magritte, where the lighting is completely haphazard, and but this exposes it and shows where it is, how it is not. So we don't assume, when I, I'm teaching a course now at Stanford on this, and, and the way I tell it to my students is, where there's the naive realism fallacy, fallacy. So uh, <laughs> other questions in here? Yeah. Go ahead. So in that image of the young lady um, Girl with the pearl earring. Close up, the crack of her was really very much apparent. And I'm wondering whether those cracks and maybe the change in sort of the, the orientation of that portion of the painting tilts and so forth influences at all any of the rest no, of the Much, painting. much too small. By the way, they, it's been remarkably uh, well preserved. They have, um, having just uh, six weeks ago, uh, they filled in all the crackler. You can you can't see any crackler, and it would be statistically, um, it, it might add some noise, but it wouldn't have a bias. Make every the light too high or the light too low, and that's what we can quantify with all those um, standard deviations. Question there. In the studio setting, I can imagine you have a big slice of, and then normal models can come in anytime. So it's natural. How do you think that when 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 you're achieving that, like taking the same lighting? You, you mean for a view of Delft or what? Like you, you look out every day at of hours uh, around the same time to catch your light, and how long will I take this walk? Yes, I mean really. Uh, there is an uncertainty with these, and so when we put a dot, it's really a spot, and you you go to the center. So in other words, um, it, it maybe some of this was done three days earlier and some three days later, but averaged over that's that's the date at least for that work. And let's see if there are any online here. If there's um, uh, wait, let me go to my Zoom. Are there oh, 15 questions? Oh my goodness. Uh, have there been incidents? Oh, I'll be fast. Audio echo, uh-oh, sorry if there's been audio echo. This is really interesting to see the realistic art pieces. Could the same lighting be applied to works in cubism? Or maybe not cubism, but um, we've done it on a whole host of um, Caravaggio, the Mannerists, and um, uh, Dada and so forth to look for a, a, a surrealism, to look for inconsistencies. So yes, it can be applied to many different techniques. The, the assistance of AI technology, looking for example, at the girl with the pearl earring, could her 3D model be made easier with the use of AI? Yes, and I have done it. It was not shown here, but you can get better models by inferring uh, lighting. Uh, excellent question. Yes, AI is revolutionizing all this stuff. Fascinating topic. I love the demo, how to find the angle. How did, how did the math reveal the depth angle? That would take a while. Email me, artanalyst, and I'm happy to answer any technical questions, but we, I think we have to move on.